Now we've talked about a whole bunch of different techniques getting better and better. Uh, we're still very reliant on Cepheid variables. Uh, the reason is that, generally speaking, the, the galaxies that have masers are not necessarily the ones that have the supernovae. Yes. So you want something which can allow you to transfer the distance you get from the maser galaxies to the ones that had type 1a supernovae, and then you can use supernovae to go out to huge distances. At the moment, we're very reliant on Cepheid variables to do that. And, and we've seen that they're not perfect, right? So it would be really good to hedge our bets and look to see if there's another method that we could use, like Cepheids, to cross-check our work. And it turns out there is another method called the tip of the red giant branch, which was actually pioneered by Gary da Costa here at Mount Stromlo. And let's explain how this works. It's using a different sort of very bright star. Now, this is a HR diagram, a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So we're plotting color here with blue stars on this side and red stars on that side. Low mass, high mass, typically, mm -hmm. when they're and on the main sequence. luminosity up here. Now, we've seen this before. You normally had the main sequence of stars, which originally would have gone all the way up here. So these would be the very massive stars burning very fast, and all the way down to the pathetic little red dwarfs with our sun somewhere in the middle. Yep. However, this HR diagram is not for just a bunch of stars in our galaxy. It's for a globular cluster, M55. And a globular cluster, all the stars formed in one burst right at the beginning, pretty much. Yeah, so this, these stars are probably more than 10 billion years old. And what's happened here is... Originally, there would have been a main sequence all the way up here, but these stars would have come to the end of their lives, stopped burning hydrogen, and moved off the main sequence and exploded. And then the slightly lower mass ones would have moved off, and so on and so forth. So by now, after 10 or 12 billion years, all the main sequence stars above there have gone. Right, and this is about eight-tenths of a solar mass. So yeah. our sun, if it were, would have had this chemical composition, would have lived its entire life in this, for this globular cluster. Yeah. So the top here tells you some estimate of the age of the globular cluster. And what you can see is the stars that were around here have now moved off and joined what's called the red giant branch, where they've become much bigger and much more luminous. Right, and that's because they've run out of hydrogen in their core, as we'll see. And what these things look like is they've burned all the hydrogen in the middle, so they've now got a core of helium. Uh, now, this helium is supported by what's called degeneracy pressure. This is a quantum mechanical thing. Those of you who did the Violet Universe course will have heard vast amounts about this then. But basically, the laws of quantum mechanics means that uh, the electrons, when you squash them into a very tiny space, have to acquire a certain amount of speed, and that speed holds the whole thing up and stops it collapsing. So the, the lump in the middle is no longer doing fusion. It's just sitting there, a very hot, very dense lump supported by this quantum mechanical motion of the electrons. And the actual fusion is happening in the shell around the outside, which is where the hydrogen is burning to form helium. Right, so hydrogen shell burning out here, making helium. And the helium, which is heavier than hydrogen, is going to be settling down on this core. So you've got like a very hot helium snow or silt or sediment or something slowly accumulating on the surface of this to generate helium core, which is kind of like a white dwarf in the middle of a star. Yep. But as the helium core is therefore going to get bigger mm. and bigger and bigger, and once again, we talked about in the Violet Universe course, there's a maximum size that a core that's supported by this quantum mechanical degeneracy pressure can reach. And we should say it hasn't become bigger in length. It actually becomes bigger in terms of its mass. It actually is becoming smaller in its length. Yes, it's like some pile of bean bags. You pile enough bean bags on top and the extra weight compresses them more, so any more bean bags actually make your pile smaller rather than larger. Right. So as the more and more mass is piled up, the core gets smaller and smaller and denser and denser, and that means the electrons have to move faster to be able to support it all. And at some point, they're getting close to the speed of light, and they just can't go any faster. Yeah, and so in practice, what happens is the core here shrinks to the point where you can take three helium atoms at a time and cram them together to make carbon, and so you actually ignite this helium relatively quickly compared to most things that happen in a star, and so you suddenly start burning stuff in the core, the helium to carbon, and oxygen, it turns out, which produces a huge amount of energy, which is going to cause the star to rearrange itself and become a red giant. So in astronomically speaking, in a blink of an eye, the whole yep. star rearranges itself and forms a new sort of star now with burning uh, helium to form carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, things like that in the centre, and still with shells of burning other stuff around the outside. At this point, it moves off the red giant branch yep. and jumps over here to the horizontal branch. And then various complicated things happen depending exactly what the mass of the star that started with. They'll have go through different 
phases of burning different things in the middle with shells around the outside, and they'll move around here, maybe even come back up the asymptotic giant branch. Some of them will turn to see field variables. There's a patch up here where they're actually see field variables. But what we're interested in is this red giant branch, where the star is just a the core of helium in the middle and the hydrogen burning shell, because this sudden transformation when the middle lights up will happen at a very precise mass set only by the laws of pressure and quantum mechanics, so it's set by fundamental physical constants. Right, and it doesn't really matter if you're a slightly bigger or slightly smaller star. The laws of quantum mechanics don't care if you're a one solar mass star or a half a solar mass star. They care about the laws of you know, what h-bar is effectively. So it should always happen at the same uh, energy, at the same mass. So these things should all look the same. In fact, it's exactly the same reason why type 1a supernovae are the same. Once again, it's set by the same physics of quantum mechanics balancing gravity. Once you go over a certain mass, you're going to get the explosion. So these are kind of like ultra mini type 1a supernovae in the middle of stars. Yes. All right, so let's look in detail how this would look in a galaxy, which we've heard about. NGC 4258, this is the galaxy that has the masers in it. So it's a special galaxy. It turns out a lot of Cepheids have been observed in it. And we can go and compare that to what the tip of the red giant branch looks like. And so you can see that little stream of stars whose nuclear reactors are getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and they reach this limit where they say, okay, that's as fast as I can go. I'm going to start burning carbon, and I'm going to go zoom off that direction. Yeah, so to so make it clear that we're zooming in just on a little bit around here. Yeah, so we're going to zoom in on that little bit. And so we see all those stars, and then, bam, there's a limit where there's some other types of stars called asymptotic giant branch stars up here we're not going to worry about right now. But there's this pileup of stars, and then none. And we can actually see exactly where this is. This is a little filter that uh, people have gone through and they can, they're looking for an edge here of where there are stars and where there are fewer stars and you can see right where it's at there. Now this is a very useful technique. It goes out to roughly the same sort of distances that Cepheids do, so it can be used as a cross-check on Cepheids to make sure that we can transfer the distance from the Mesa galaxies to the ones with the Type 1a supernovae. And it's also observationally quite easy because you just need to take one really good Hubble Space Telescope image of a galaxy. Whereas to get Cepheids, you need to take dozens of images to look for the change in here in the oscillation and measure all that. Whereas here you just get one, a narrow bin, and pick, oh, two actually, two different colors. Yeah, um, the, the other advantage is, is that this works very well in old populations of stars. And Cepheid variables only occur in young populations of stars, so it's the type we use for measuring distances. And so this allows us to work, for example, in elliptical galaxies as well, which also host type 1a supernovae. Yes, because type 1a supernovae come from quite old, no one's quite sure what they come from exactly, but they're, they're old populations. So they Older can come in old galaxies. Yeah. So another sec very useful method, and by and large it gives the same answer as Cepheids. OK, so we have another arrow in our quiver for understanding the extragalactic distance scale. And Paul, it strikes me that this is as good as it's going to get right now, so it's time to talk about the answers. Yes.